Hello and welcome to today's talk on how to model credit risk and today I'm going to be covering a discriminant analysis. Now discriminant analysis is pretty widely used in credit risk modeling uh, even though you might not recognize the name and it's most commonly used through what's known as Altman's z-score which uses discriminant analysis to give a score which allows you to determine whether a candidate firm is likely to default or likely to remain solvent. So what I'm going to do in this talk is just run through exactly how discriminant analysis works, how you can calculate it yourself, how you could determine your own version of the z-score if you, if you want, um, but just show why it's uh, another useful and relatively simple way of um, distinguishing between uh, two different categories of data. So discriminant analysis is already commonly used in credit risk modeling um, and it has been used for quite a few decades so it's not a particularly new technique but it is relatively powerful and reasonably straightforward so it's definitely worth, definitely worth learning. The form of discriminant analysis looks quite similar to a regression. So say you've got uh, N firms and N financial measures so for firm little n the various measures you've got are XM1, XM2, uh, down to XMN. Um, the discriminant function, DM, is uh, described as beta1 XM1 plus beta2 XM2 plus all the way up to beta n XMN, where beta n is um, a parameter which is the same for all firms. And, and the point about this parameter is you tweak it to try to get particular characteristics of this discriminant function. So you've got these M firms, but for the purposes of what we're looking at, the M firms fall into two groups. And one of these groups is, say, firms that have defaulted, because we're looking at a training set here, and one is a group of firms that hasn't defaulted. And the key to finding out what the values of beta M are is to try and come up with values of the discriminant function such that if you're looking at a particular group, such as defaulted firms, those DMs are grouped together as tightly as possible. Whereas if you're looking at the average of the value of DM for, say, the defaulted group and the average for the non-defaulted group, you want them as far away as possible. So you're trying to get as little variability within the groups as possible and as much distance between the middles of the two groups as possible. So, so what those betas are essentially doing is they are trying to make sure that they give more weight to um, the different measures which are going in, say, opposite directions, to push them in the same direction. And they also perform a scaling function to make sure that any um, variable which is a different order of magnitude than the others is brought towards the same kind of order of magnitude as the others. So you kind of got the betas making sure that all of the x's are pushing in the right direction for um, the different, uh, different groups, for the, for the firms in the different groups. So what we've got here is a chart, uh, or a couple of charts, just uh, showing what I was saying before, that um, you've essentially got two groups here, and it's worth saying you can have more than two groups when you're doing discriminant uh, analysis, but when, since we're looking at credit, it's just two groups we're considering here. And the data uh, is in one of these two groups, either defaulted or non-defaulted firms. And the object is to arrive at discriminant functions where you minimise the difference between the value of the discriminant function within each group, but you maximize the difference between the averages between these two groups. So if we look at the uh, top chart here, you can see that um, the values of the discriminant function in terms of the frequency overlap quite a lot, so they're not particularly well discriminated. Whereas in the bottom chart, you've got much tighter grouping within these two charts, so much better discriminated data. And what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to choose values of beta which give a picture closer to the bottom function and uh, uh, further away from, from the top one. So there's a few different types of discriminant analysis out there. The, the classic one is Fisher's linear discriminant. Um, and what this does is it first looks at the difference between the group averages which it calls centroids. 
So let's call the average of dm for the two groups 1 and 2, d bar 1 and d bar 2. And let's say the vector of financial measures for groups 1 and 2 is uh, x bar 1 and x bar 2. So this is the average across each of the financial measures within each group. So if we're looking at, say, um, EBIT over assets, um, that would be, if you take the average of EBIT over assets for um, all of the firms in the first group, that would be the first item in this vector. If you had log of assets over liabilities, if you took the average of that over all the firms in the first group, uh, that would be the second item in the first vector, and, and so on. So what we need to maximise then is the difference between these two uh, average discriminant functions, d bar 1 and d bar 2. And the way to do that is if you just take d bar 1 minus d bar 2 and you square it, um, you're going to get something which is always positive. So you need to make sure that is as large as possible. Now, um, dm, we saw it's equal to that long uh, sum of... Um, uh, beta 1 plus x1 plus beta 2 plus x2 and so on. If you've got beta as a vector and you've got um, x bar 1 as a vector then beta transpose x bar 1 minus beta transpose x bar 2 all squared is the same as d bar 1 minus d bar 2 all squared. Um, that bit of vector multiplication gives you the, gives you the value of uh, the discriminant function for, for the average firm in group 1 and group 2. So, as we say here, beta is the vector of coefficients. So, that's dealt with the uh, averages. The next thing we want to do is look at the variability within the groups. So, let's call S1 and S2 the sample covariance matrices for XM1, XM2, XMN, and so on in each group. So, what that tells you is the um, covariance between these different items across all of the different firms within each group. And what this means is that the variability of dm within each group is beta transpose S1 beta and beta transpose S2 beta. So the total variability is proportional to beta transpose S1 beta plus beta transpose S2 beta. Now this is important because we, we, when we're talking about trying to maximise the difference between the two groups and minimise the variability within the groups, there's no one set of betas which will do that. There's no one vector beta that will do that. All we can get is a set of betas which are unique in terms of their relationship to each other. Because if you think about that, uh, those charts on the uh, slide earlier where we looked at what well discriminated data looks like. You could double all the values on the horizontal axis so you could make the discriminant functions twice as big and you get just the same level of separation between the centroids and lack of separation within each group. So it's not the absolute value that matters, it's the proportions um, that the, the size of the betas relative to each other. And that's why the total variability is proportional to beta transpose S1 beta plus beta transpose S2 beta rather than defined by it. So, want to maximize the distance between and minimize the variability within, we need to maximize this function df, which is basically a function of the things that we just talked about. Beta transpose X1 bar minus beta transpose X2 bar all squared divided by uh, beta transpose S1 beta plus beta transpose S2 beta. So essentially, the top part of that is the difference between the centroids uh, squared, and the bottom of that is the variability within each of those two groups. So if you make the top bigger and or you make the bottom smaller, then you get a larger value of D, uh, DF. Now you can take out the um, beta transpose uh, and the beta from those equations to rearrange it and what you can end up with is something which gives you the value of beta where maximum separation occurs. So beta hat f which is the estimate of the Fisher discriminant for vector beta and that's proportional to s1 plus s2 to the minus 1 so the inverse of the sum of those covariance matrices uh, 
multiplied by x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So the difference between those averages. So it's a relatively straightforward bit of matrix algebra to get you um, the uh, estimates for uh, vector beta. So you've got this vector. Um, if you take this estimate, uh, beta hat uh, f, you transpose it, and you multiply it by the average of um, x bar 1 and x bar 2. So essentially the midpoint between um, those two centroids for the various measures. What you get is the threshold score. So depending on whether um, your betas are um, positive or negative, because you know proportional can mean times minus one, you can use this to see whether a new firm is expected to be solvent or expected to be insolvent, because you just calculate a value of dm using the parameters that you've got, um, beta uh, f hat, and you multiply that by the measures that you've got for this new firm, and if dm is greater than dc, then you might expect default. If dm is less than dc, then you might expect solvency. So that's how you use um, discriminant analysis in, uh, in analyzing credit risk. You calculate this, this score using the training data, so using firms that you know have either defaulted or not defaulted. And then we get a new firm that comes along. You put in its score and use that score to see whether you think that new firm is going to default or not. Now, Fisher's linear discriminant, I mean, any sort of analysis, isn't perfect. And you've got a confidence interval which can be described as a zone of ignorance, um, which essentially means that if you get a score which falls within this zone of ignorance, which is defined by a particular level of uh, confidence, then that means that you're not certain whether the firm is going to default or, or not default. And the way that you calculate this zone of ignorance is you look at the uh, left tail of the right-hand distribution and the right tail of the left-hand distribution. So the lower tail of the right-hand distribution and the upper tail of the left-hand distribution. And you essentially calculate in terms of the um, averages less um, a normal distribution function multiplied by the standard deviation within each group. Now, a slight simplification of Fisher's linear discriminant is something called linear discriminant um, analysis. And the only simplification here is that you just assume that both groups have the same covariance matrix. So um, S1 is equal to S2 is equal to S. So when you're calculating that covariance matrix or the covariance matrices for both groups, instead you just calculate covariance across all the firms that you've got. And this slightly simplifies the equation. Instead of now having S1 plus S2 in the uh, denominator of your um, calculation for capital D, you've now got um, a single covariance matrix on the bottom. And what this means is that your estimator now, beta hat LDA, is proportional just to the inverse of this covariance matrix multiplied by the difference between the uh, vectors of the two centroids, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So it's relatively straightforward. Now, it's probably easier to see, to, to understand what's going on if we look at this using some actual data. So what I've done is put together an example of linear discriminant analysis um, in, in Excel. So this is some data which I've used um, before for other analysis. And essentially, if you look at the first five columns, this shows you what the, what the data is. So in the first column, um, I've got a marker for default. If it's one, it means the firm has defaulted. If it's zero, it means the firm hasn't defaulted. Then I've got um, four measures that I use for this firm, which aren't particularly well chosen. They're just things which probably relate to how likely a firm is to, to do well. So the first is EBIT over assets, so just earnings poor interest um, and tax divided by the assets to standardize it. Then the log of assets over liabilities, retained earnings over assets, again, to standardize it, and free cash flow over assets. And I've got this for, for 50 firms. So the first thing I want to do is to just count how many firms I have got in each. So I just do a countif function based on zero for not defaulting and one 
for defaulting. And that gives me 40, which didn't default, and 10, which defaulted. I then total um, the values of these four variables over uh, each of these two groups. So EBIT over assets for the non-defaulting firms and um, for defaulting firms, log of assets over liabilities for defaulting and non-defaulting firms, and so on. And then if I simply divide these totals by the number of firms in each group, I get the averages. And what that means is that cells uh, I5 to L5, that is the vector of the averages of these measures. So it is um, X bar 1 and I6 to L6 is X bar 2. So that's reasonably straightforward. Now because I'm doing linear discriminant analysis rather than Fisher's linear discriminant, um, I only need to calculate the covariance matrix across all the firms rather than trying to divide them, which is quite handy because it means this is what covariance matrix looks like. And this is the covariance bet uh, between the first series in itself, which is clearly the variance, between the third series and the first series, and, and so on. And then it's fairly straightforward to just get from the two vectors in rows 5 and 6 and the matrix in rows 8 to 11 to get to the beta hats. It's basically doing a bit of matrix multiplication in Excel. And what I do is I take the inverse of that covariance matrix and multiply it by, well, I've got here the transpose of um, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. And the reason I've got the transpose is because even though they're vectors, they're kind of going on the side. So they're, they're already transposed in terms of the way that, the way that we're looking at them. But, but this gives me the values for, for beta hat. And then what I can do for further analysis is simply multiply um, these values of beta hat by the um, uh, original data, by the original variables, and that gives me values of dm, the discriminant function, for um, each of the different firms, which becomes important when we're looking at this analysis later on. So the next thing that we want to look at is um, what happens with a new candidate firm, and, and, and what happens in terms of things like the, um, the, the zone of ignorance and, and calculating that. So to look at that, we need to just um, scoot across a bit. So you'll see DN, DM is now the farthest left column. And when we're calculating the zone of ignorance, what we need to come up with is the standard deviations within each group. So the little um, algorithm I tend to use for things like that to separate out um, groups of data. And essentially what it says is, but for, well, first column, column W is just copying across the default information from... Um, from column A. And what I do is I say if um, this value is equal to zero, then um, column X goes up by one. If it doesn't, then it stays the same. In the next column, I've just got something which simply goes up by one all the time. And then I've got a lookup function. I look up the values going up one at a time in the um, uh, array which is uh, columns X and Y to try to find out whereabouts, how many rows offset the non-defaulting firms are. And if you see here, it goes up um, to, uh, it goes up in line with the count as far as you get to 10, but then jumps to 16 because uh, the next five firms are actually defaulting firms. And what I can do with this is then offset in um, column N by the values in Z, and that will give me, in turn, all of the non-defaulting firms, or the values of DM for the non-defaulting firms. Now, I do exactly the same thing for the uh, defaulting firms as well, and those values are, are in AE. So, you can see then that the standard deviation that I calculate uh, in for, from column AA, that's the standard deviation for group 1, the non-defaulting firms. And uh, I then calculate the standard deviation for the defaulting firms. And you can see actually that the standard deviation for the non-defaulting firms is much tighter than standard deviation for the uh, defaulting firms. So scooting back over, um, because we want to use the, uh, the, the values of beta hat, you can see we've still got this information. I've just um, moved back away from the, uh, meth the, the, the raw data used to calculate um, SD1 and SD2. So, to calculate DC, 
calculate the, 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 the cutoff score. What I simply do is multiply um, beta hat transpose by the um, average of those two uh, x bar vectors. Again, transpose because they're horizontal rather than vertical. And that gives me the score for DC. I've also got the scores for D1 and D2, which are the averages for the solvent and insolvent um, firm, so the centroids there. And I can then calculate the zone of ignorance, which is, as I say, based on the uh, left tail of the larger um, firm, the, the, the right-hand distribution, because the solvent firms are on the right. You can see D1 is bigger than D2, and using that standard deviation. Um, and the uh, other side is using the uh, right-hand of the left-hand distribution. And then I've got these uh, solvent candidate and insolvent candidate here. And what I do then is multiply the solvent candidate by um, beta hat and the insolvent candidate by beta hat. And that gives me the two scores here. So we can see that it looks like the solvent candidate is probably solvent and the insolvent candidate is probably insolvent. So you can see by the way that they sit that uh, the solvent candidate is much closer to D1. Uh, the insolvent is much closer to uh, D2 and they are either side of DC. So they, 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 they sit in about the right place. Now, it's also possible to do this um, analysis in, in R, and, and it's quite nice doing it in R because it checks out some probabilities as well, which is, which is quite helpful. Um, doing it in R, I use exactly the same data. Um, it, uh, and, and if you need a, an explanation of how to use R, if you look in the um, earlier um, credit session on GLMs, that shows you in detail how to set up R and, and how I like to use um, R. The, the two packages I use for this are the um, XLSX package, which allows you to read in data from a spreadsheet, and the MASS package, which um, has the um, information in that allows us to, to run the analysis that we want to run. So the data I've got is in sheets two and three um, of this particular worksheet. So sheet two has got the training data, and sheet three has the uh, data on the, on the candidates. So here's the code for running that example uh, in R. As I said, the training data is on the second worksheet, and, and the code below it imports this, displays the results, and then performs LDI and shows the results of that as well. So the first two lines, what they do is they uh, install the packages, or rather they load the packages XLSX and MASS. So the library function is what actually puts this into memory and tells R that it's going to be using it. I then read uh, the XLSX sheet number two from the credit example workbook and put it into a data frame called training file. And uh, I then um, show or display the training file so I can just make sure it's pulled in the right data. And then I run the LDA function and put the results into a data frame called LDA results. And this is a particular data frame which um, I will be able to tell is the results of um, linear discriminant analysis. And that's quite important for um, the prediction that we'll, we'll do later. So the form of the LDA function is similar to a regression function. You've got the equivalent to your dependent variable, which is called default. And that's explained by EBIT over assets, log of assets over liabilities, retained earnings over assets, and free cash flow over assets. Now R is going to say, well, where do you get this information? Default, EBIT over assets, and so on. And you say, well, it's from the data, which is in training file. And because training file, the columns actually have these particular names, that's what tells the LDA function where it's going to get this information from. And then when you've run the LDA and put it into LDA result, you actually want to see what LDA result is. So you run it. So this is what the code actually looks like in, in R Studio, which is the way that I prefer to, to, to use R. And when you run the results, you can see them. Um, first on the uh, uh, window at the back, it's running those two library functions. Um, I've then got a bit of quoted text because I'm uh, sometimes good and I try to make sure I uh, remind myself what I've done in the code. Um, the training file uh, reads in that information and then shows it is indeed the information that we had previously in the spreadsheet. And then I run and view the results 
uh, and viewing the results, you can see you've got some um, beta hat figures, which are in fact different from the ones that we had um, in the Excel calculations. Having said that, they are exactly, or the Excel results are exactly um, minus 1.1824 times the results in R. And if you remember what I said before, it isn't the um, value of the parameters that matter, it's the relationship they have to each other. So given that the beta hat numbers from Excel are a fixed proportion of the results in R, that's, that's what really matters. And, and in that case, it's, in that sense, it's reassuring that we've got the same results in um, R that we got in, in Excel. So, as I said, we've got this thing called LDA result, and, and R knows that this is a result of uh, linear discriminant analysis. And that's helpful because it then allows us to um, test um, candidate firms using the information we've got from this training file. So this information is read from tab three of the workbook and it uses something called the predict function. Now, the information that we got, um, it shows the first candidate which we know is solvent, is likely solvent, and the second candidate um, that we know is insolvent is, is probably insolvent. So, so that's all good. And then the code for this is again, we read in um, this time tab three from the credit example worksheet and put it in something called test file. And then we create something called test result using uh, a function called predict. And we're going to predict using LDA result, which is the result of the LDA analysis. And then columns two to five of the test file. So excluding the um, default score that we had in, in column one. And then we display the test results. So here you can see reading in and displaying the test data. Um, is this how it looks in the code, uh, and then determining the likely category is the, is the next part. And when we read in the test file, we can see those results look identical to what was in the Excel spreadsheet, um, so that's good. And then when we look at the test result, it says, well, there are two classes, two levels, level zero and one. And what it estimates is that the first candidate is very likely to be in uh, group zero, and the second candidate is more likely than not to be in group one. So confirms the results that we had in the previous analysis. So that's a fairly quick run through uh, discriminant analysis. There, there is a bit more to it than this, um, particularly if you're looking at more than one uh, category. In the same way that if you're looking at GLMs, you know, the GLMs that we look at, we're looking at low and probit models where you've only got two outcomes, but you can have multi-category ones. And a lot of the other stuff that you'll read on discriminant analysis is going to be looking at more than two categories. But, you know, um, for the analysis that we're looking at, you either default or you don't. So it is um, more relevant here to look at just the two categories. And, and hopefully that um, analysis is, is useful and, and shows you that, again, you can just plug this into R to get some results out, but it's not actually too hard to run this analysis in an Excel spreadsheet. You know, it involves a little bit of scrolling back and forth, a little bit of clever code to split out some of the results from the defaulted and non-defaulted firms. But the, uh, at the end of the day, the, the calculation of that um, discriminant score, the calculation of the cutoff, is really not that hard. And, and I do think it is useful to do some of this stuff in Excel to show you um, what's going on underneath. So for, for me, it's particularly helpful to, to understand exactly what is going on, how this is working, before I start playing around with things in R. So then I'm more likely to be able to say whether something looks right or, or doesn't look right, because I understand what, what the calculations are doing. Anyway, I hope that was useful. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please uh, leave me any questions uh, on, uh, in the comments section, uh, which I'll try to answer. And please make sure that you uh, subscribe to this channel if you want to uh, be made aware of the next time that I publish something. Thank you very much.